Pass around and speak into. Oh, um, wonderful. So our panelists, okay, take this. It's on, and this is on. Mm -hmm. And it all records automatically? Yep. That's mm -hmm. Just like a, like a, what do you call it? Like a Chivo. Yeah. Sort of thing. We're, we're awesome. You're so much more high tech over here than we are in, <laughs> on our side in global health. Uh, That's great. Oh, wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm sure your IT guys and, and the IT at the UW are originally working for that. Yeah, they're working towards this. <laughs> if they already haven't done so. There's a slider thing to do. And that's the there? Yeah, the laser pointer slider advancer, so um, it doesn't and that is to use the slide advance to advance the slide does not have to be pointed in any direction. It's glued to. Of course laser pointer you have to point in right. a certain direction. Okay, but the slide can be anywhere. Right, exactly. Okay. Are you here? There we are. So this is what it's going to mean. If I want to navigate onto the internet, I can just do it from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You use Firefox. I use Explorer. All right. Those yours are up. Mine are up. Uh, and Beth, we're right there. Just plugs right into here. Oh, I can just put it in here. Sure. Oh, so on. Okay, so they, they know what Maybe I should, um, if we have time, uh, look at 
um, Jen slides. Um, she would probably like them. Yeah. That's okay. Then that's that's fine. <laughs> Right, without the slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're coming here. <laughs> and she really appreciates your, yeah, you're being able to do this. Um, all right, let me give her back the abs. Just three people then. Great. A question from the audience. Um, is the light level in here good? Can you see these slides clearly? Yeah? Great? Okay, wonderful. All right, that's a good place to start then. Welcome everyone um, to Legal and Policy Solutions. I'll abbreviate the name here um, because we have a packed agenda tonight. Welcome. This is our first session. Um, this course um, is being jointly offered through the School of Law and the Department of Global Health and also co-hosted by Global Watch. I'm going to go through some short um, housekeeping items here for the students. So the seminar series is open to the public, um, but it is also a UW course. So stu graduate students can register for one credit. It's a credit, non-credit course. Um, Pretty much everything you need to know you can find on the course website. Um, there's actually two websites. One is a Canvas platform website. If people are familiar with that, they're welcome to use that platform. Um, everyone will see the course under GH590. So even the law students, if you pick 590, you'll have access to all of the, uh, the course items. There's also a second site set up on the law school website. So if you prefer to use that platform, both websites will have exactly the same thing. Um, so you'll find the syllabus, suggested readings for each course, um, for each seminar, um, a calendar, speaker biographies, the recorded sessions, so we're going to record each one of these talks, and also contact information. Um, so you have two course organizers, um, myself, I'm Jennifer Sliker, and then you have another Jennifer from the law school, um, Jen Langalong, who you might know from Global Health Law. Um, you can email either of us if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Um, for folks who are sitting in, as guests in the course and aren't registered students, we're happy to give you access to the website. So just send us an email um, if you'd like to participate as an observer. Uh, there's also a discussion board there, and we'd be very happy for you to post your thoughts and comments on the sessions as we go through the course. Um, in terms of student requirements, this is a one-credit course. In order to get credit, we ask for participation in at least 70% of the sessions. And by participation, we mean doing readings, coming to class, um, asking questions. We ask that you please sign in. Uh, where's our sign-in sheet? It's going around great. For students, this is important so we can just track participation. For guests, we'd love to find out who's coming to these and how many people we're getting. Um, and if you're interested in joining Global Watch and getting emails about us regarding grants, internships, fellowships, and other courses like this, then just tick the box, put your email, and we'll put you on our list. Uh, last housekeeping point is parking. So there's two good places to park for this course if you haven't already found them. The end lot is very close um, and also the UW bookstore. 
So before we get started, um, I'll just go over a couple quick ground rules for discussion. Um, we're going to try to keep to time because these are the, the main goal for this format is to have a lot of discussion time. So we'll try to get the speakers to keep to time. Um, the audience, we ask that you state your name and department or organization when you ask a, a question or make a comment. Um, and only the panelists are going to have microphones, so we ask that the, whoever is answering the question repeat the question so that everyone else um, can hear. Um, and also, interestingly, this is a really heterogeneous group, so we actually have students here from a number of different programs. So we ask that, if possible, to avoid any specific medical or legal or technical jargon so that everyone can participate in the conversation. All right, so we can get started with the first session. Um, this is our launch, Reducing Maternal Infant Mortality. Um, so we're very pleased to have Professor Kessler and Grace John Stewart here who will offer some opening remarks and welcome you to the session. Well, I want to welcome you on behalf of our law school to uh, the law school building for the launch of this wonderful series. Uh, this is a collaboration between our law school and the Department of Global Health. And we're very excited about this in the, in the sense that it gives us an opportunity to really explore the many interdisciplinary issues that affect global health today, and particularly uh, the global health of women, adolescents, and children, which, is most, which most of you know is sort of the key to achieving an improved, uh, glo improved global health picture over the next generation. Uh, during the course of uh, our term, we will have a number of wonderful sessions and wonderful speakers. Uh, and uh, I think it will cover uh, pretty much the territory uh, of the law and policy aspects of, of these very compelling issues. And maybe I could turn it over to my colleague here who will talk a little bit more about the meat of the course. Well, I, again, I just am really happy to see everybody here. And I'm really excited to see what will happen as a result of people from many different disciplines talking together about issues which are close to all of our hearts. Um, in terms of Global Watch, part of our motivation is we like to try and understand the life cycle between women, adolescents, and children and how they're tied together. And Dr. Sliker and Lengalong really took a lot of time to try and bring a lot of different viewpoints. And in each of the panels, there are people who look at these issues from one perspective. And what often happens is that one perspective is an isolated perspective and doesn't take into account a perspective that might be from uh, the legal perspective or the policy perspective or the health perspective. So having the three sort of articulate their lens of how they see the issues and bringing them together across the life cycle, we're hopeful, will generate some discussions and, and some relationships across uh, many of you who are embarking on your careers. So we're excited to see this. The speaker list, if you've looked at the schedule, uh, many times when people put together courses, there's just one speaker per, t per session and, and uh, it's a fairly meaty interaction with the one speaker. But to a person, every one of the speakers that have been selected for this, these panels are really uh, bring a, a huge wealth of expertise or a perspective that's very important. And so there are all kinds of topics that I think uh, you're, you're going to get interest um, in seeing how people look at them across these perspectives. So we decided we were going to talk for a very short time to give you more time for the panel. So we can go ahead with the introduction of the speakers. So yeah, let us turn this back to our, our, our leader here. <laughs> thank you. All right, last bit of thank yous before we start. I want to thank Associate Dean Kuzler, Jennifer Snyder, and the Center for Law, Science, and Global Health for supporting this course. Um, thank you, Professor John Stewart, the Department of Global Health and Global Watch for also supporting the series, and we're very excited about this new collaboration. Um, also, a big thank you to Vicki Parker, Mike Rufo, um, Alex Phillips and Kiara Wichter for all the amazing hard work you've put into organizing this series, which has almost 50 speakers. Um, and also, Jen Lengalong would like to express a huge thank you to Professor Ribbon for filling in for her tonight. So one of our panelists actually was taken down by a stomach flu. Um, Jen Lengalong won't be joining us tonight, but her content will still be part of this talk. Um, so we'll open the session on reducing maternal infant mortality. Um, I'll start by introducing our panelists for tonight. Um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Dillis Walker, is an obstetrician gynecologist on the Faculty of Medicine and Global Health. She is also an invited professor at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, where she worked for 12 years in the Department of Re Reproductive Health. She is the co-founder and executive director of Pronto International, an emergency obstetric and neonatal training program that is grounded in low-tech, high-fidelity simulation. 
Uh, her research has focused on prevention of unplanned adolescent pregnancy, task sharing in obstetrics, abortion, family planning, and maternal mortality. Cynthia Semeca is an undergrad in public health, geography, and global health departments. Her intended area of research is health disparities in Africa, particularly the social determinants of health and inequality among youth. Ms. Semeca was born and raised in Kenya. She speaks more than eight languages and has visited many countries in Africa. She is also active in academic and non-academic organizations focusing on public health, and she plans to pursue a doctoral degree in public health. Dr. Beth Riven is a professor in the UW School of Law. She is also the director of the Global Health and Justice Project, a multidisciplinary project that encompasses academic activities at the UW and field activities in developing countries in collaboration with the non-governmental organization Uplift International. Professor Riven co-directs the Certificate in International Bioethics, Social Justice and Health. Her experience includes pediatrics and adolescent medicine, epidemiology, emergency humanitarian assistance, and human rights program development and evaluation. Professor Riven has experience domestically and in Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. And so with that, we'll start our panel. And I'll let Dillis take it from here. And you should have your slides here. Great. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation here. Um, it is really an honor for me to be here with such a diverse and interesting group of people, and I really want to keep my comments short and try to really just set the stage for you so we do have some time at the end of this to really hear some of your viewpoints and what you can bring to the table, because I'm sure each and every one of you will have some thoughts after this session. Um, so as I said, what my job here is to set the stage and let you know why we're talking about this, how big is the problem, and um, sort of the global health perspective of it before we turn it over to the legal and health policy aspects. So when we start talking about maternal mortality, I think um, one of the first things is to uh, go a little bit to definitions. So when we talk about a maternal death, a maternal death is when a woman dies during pregnancy, or within 42 days after that pregnancy from causes due to that pregnancy. Okay? So there are direct deaths, which are due to things like hemorrhage, preeclampsia infection, and there are indirect deaths that also count, which are deaths in the context of which, for example, a woman who has a cardiac condition and by being pregnant, that is exacerbated and then she dies from complications of that. Okay? Now, I think one point that's important to consider because these maternal mortality indicators and what we use to measure success or um, failures in that area is the maternal mortality ratio and it does not include deaths due to things like domestic violence, homicide or suicide. So those deaths do not get counted in these um, indicators. So a lot of the drive that has been going on in the, in the area of the last, um, since 2000, has been due to the Millennium Development Goals. And hopefully this will be the first time you, or in the la maybe the last time you hear about this over the, ne over the course of the seminar. But it was a partnership with the goal to reduce extreme poverty by 2015. And it was signed by countries. So for me, that's the interesting part. It was the countries, the country governments that signed on to these goals, and 189 countries signed on to this, with their goal being, you know, there were eight Millennium Development Goals, and we are going to be focusing mostly on number four and five. N Millennium Development Goal four is to reduce under five mortality rate by two-thirds before 2015, and MDG 5 is to reduce maternal mortality ratio by three quarters. Again, I failed to mention that the maternal mortality ratio is the number of deaths per 100,000 live births. And in this, what you're seeing is where the majority of those deaths are occurring and where you have high maternal mortality ratios and where you have lower maternal mortality ratios. I'm just realizing that my slides are out of order. I apologize. Um, what this slide actually shows is once you hear those Millennium Development Goals, this slide shows you which countries are actually going to reach those goals. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Those are the maternal mortality ratios. And you can see the blue countries are the countries that have low maternal mortality ratios. And you get to the pink countries, which the colors are changed in my uh, slide sets, which is why I've been confused here. Um, 
where you have the higher maternal mortality ratios. And you can see that the higher maternal mortality ratios are focused pretty much in sub-Sahara Africa. Then we have the Millennium Development Goals. And here we have a projection as to which countries are going to meet Millennium Development Goals and when they're going to meet them. In the red, you see that those are estimated to be achieving those goals by 2014, 2040, not 2015. And in the darker blue are the nine countries which are expected to meet the developed Millennium Development Goals by 2015. So when you think about maternal mortality and maternal deaths, I think it's important to consider um, why are women dying and where they're dying. This graphic gives you an idea of the major causes of death, and in the red are the causes due to hemorrhage. The far left column is Sub-Saharan Africa, South, A South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, Latin America, and then developed regions. It gives you an idea of the very um, extreme disparity in when and where and how women are dying. Uh, the red is uh, hemorrhage, and then the other causes are hypertensive disease, uh, sepsis infection, and obstructed labor. The, what I think is also interesting here is the light green that you see in sub-Saharan Africa are those uh, increase the indirect deaths due to, significantly due to HIV. I think the other time when we start thinking about um, and I think the reasons that women die, the causes of the death, and when they die is important when you start thinking about interventions and strategies to decrease this and meet, to meet the Millennium Development Goals. When it comes to maternal deaths, you can see that there's a, a focus or a concentration of death right around the day that that pregnancy ends, whether it's through abortion, delivery, uh, it's, you know, the majority of deaths occur right around day one after the end of that pregnancy. So what I wanted to do now is just show you all, if I could get this to turn back on, so I know how to do that as a new techie person here. There, um, I don't know how many of you are all familiar with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, but if any of you need any statistics, here we go. Yep. What I want to do is show you how to navigate to get some very interesting uh, data and statistics that have a lot to do with what we're talking about here today, and I will show you how and where to go. So this is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation site, and if you go to Tools, you can see Data Visualizations. So we're going to go there, and you can scroll through and you can see what they have done for estimates and calculations for the entire world um, for all different sorts of categories, life expectancy, deaths due to malaria, and we're going to skip here down to page four, and you're going to see here we have, you can navigate and interact, each of these you can interact with the tool. For example, we're going to go to maternal mortality in relation to GDP, education, neonatal mortality, skilled birth attendance, and total fertility rate by country. So I'm going to push interact with the tool. Let's see how it comes up. And what you see is a map of the world. And this gives you the overall number of deaths uh, throughout the out time, and we can start, uh, you can pick which year you want to look on, so you go down here and it will say, you can click if you can see where my, um, scan, my cursor is, I can go for the years, or I can sort of scan it through time. Then I can look to the data here, go into data, and there, there we looked at overall deaths. Now what we're going to look at is, let's go to skilled birth attendance. So one of the major factors that has been found to be um, critical for decreases in maternal mortality worldwide is that you have a, someone there that is skilled to attend the birth. If I click on skilled birth attendance, and I'll go to 2008, this will show us in 2008, I go up here in the far left corner, you can see the countries with the lowest skilled birth attendance. Again, there that is sub-Saharan Africa. Then it, you go to, as you go higher and higher, you can scan throughout the world and get an idea of what is happening in terms of skilled birth attendance in 2008. Or I can switch to another year and see what it was like that year. Then I can go and look in the same data, collect, data tool I get rid of that, I could look at maternal education. And then you can, in, in many of these tools, you can, in the next one, so I'm, you know, this one we could spend hours looking at this and contemplating how 
um, maternal mortality rates are correlated with neonatal mortality rates, how they're correlated with skilled birth attendance, how they're correlated with GDP or with total fertility rates. And it will, looking at those trends and those curves, will certainly make you start thinking about where, when, and how interventions potentially should be designed that might have some impact. Um, I'm going to just go back. I don't know if it will work now, but when I was looking through this to organize this, I spent the most time on this one, interactive tool with the maternal mortality relationship, again, to GDP, education, neonatal mortality, interact with the tool, and you can, which I don't think it's going to load now, but if you look at this later, you can follow it through, you can push a button and it tracks it for the last 20 years, either in the entire world or you can pick a country and see in relation to um, skilled birth attendance, as that has gone up, has maternal mortality dropped in terms of rates of education or levels of education? As that goes up, how does your maternal mortality ratio drop? And you will find that by looking at that, you can see some of these um, countries in which are true successes. And some of those countries, as you start looking at those curves, you begin to think about why what is going on there is going on there and, and how um, sort of some of the broader legal policy issues might be playing a, a greater role. So with that, hopefully that gives you a bit of a global perspective as to what we're talking about and what the importance is and where you can turn to get some more information about it. Um, I would like to turn the microphone over to a dear colleague of mine, also known as Princess by her friends and family, who's going to tell us her story. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. Nobody forced me. It's because I love you guys. Okay, there he goes. Begin. I'm 21 years of age. I was born and raised in a Kenyan community. Growing up, I watched as people helplessly died from curable diseases. Accessing health care was not an easy task. One had to travel miles to reach the nearest clinic. Growing up, I knew this lady called Rebecca. To her family, she was Reb. To the community and her students, she was Mwalimu. To me, she was my African queen while I was her princess. She wore many hats. In, which included being a teacher, a mom, a daughter, a wife, a sister, and an artist. Yes, she loved art, just like her daughter. Above all, she loved to smile. You'd never tell when she was angry, sad, in pain, happy, or disgusted. Just before turning 18 years of age, Rebecca became pregnant. This was really tough for her because she got kicked out both from her home and her fiancé's home. As a girl, was only allowed to be married, not when she was pregnant, but had to be married as a virgin. She had no alternative but to move with her aunt. In return, she had to do all the domestic chores and also help out in the sugarcane plantation. When time came for her to deliver a baby, all did not go well. She didn't have a midwife, nor was she taken to hospital due to lack of ta funds. The only option left was to deliver the baby at home. Unfortunately, when she got into labor, she began bleeding heavily. She almost lost her life. She had to be rushed to the nearest clinic on a wheelbarrow. Due to the idea that it was December 24th, there was no doctor around. She had to be assisted. Luckily, a nurse was found. She delivered her baby boy. After the birth of a son, Rebecca vowed not to have any kids anymore until she put herself through college. At the age of 22, she had a second child. This was her worst pregnancy, as explained to me. Her and her baby almost lost their lives. Her baby girl had developed breathing problems while she had serious bleeding and developed an infection. Her family was barely there to support her because they had, they had believed that she had been on birth control, which was true, and they believed it was a punishment from the ancestors for tying her womb. It's Africa, don't ask. <laughs> Due to the stigma and isolation, she decided to move to the city with her husband. She began a career as a teacher. 
between her second pregnancy and her third pregnancy was 10 years. In the 10-year period, she had four pregnancies and miscarried all of them due to various reasons ranging from abuse and medical complications. In December 2006, December 26, Reb finally took her last breath while she was undergoing surgery due to complications that she had developed during the delivery of her third child. She passed away at the age of 36. Reb had come from a huge family. Her mom had had 15 kids, whereby 12 had passed away. Out of the 12 deaths, seven were women, all who had passed away during child delivery or a complication during pregnancy. Moreover, she recently lost four nieces during child delivery processes. And this was in 2010. After the death of Reb, this was a wake-up call for me. I realized I needed to be the change in the community that I wanted. At the moment, I was 14 years of age, and I began volunteering at maternity, maternity clinics. I wanted to understand why so many women, girls, and babies died during delivery process. At the clinics, I was amazed of the things that happened. Most of the time, women would be in labor, but there would be no one to assist them. This was because of shortage of nurses, and also due to the fact that some of them had not paid the user fees for the hospital. Sometimes I watched as women bled to death. This idea saddened my heart. Sometimes the nurses would be mean and abusive to the women. This, was, this is what pushed me to pursue a career in maternal and child health. Even though I had picked up the responsibility of being a mom to Rebecca's kids, I was determined to not only honor her, but always achieve my dreams of working with teenage girls who had become pregnant at a tender age. I know you're wondering why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you because I care. Care as a feeling of love, care as a status obligation, and care as a social ontology of connection and relation. Moreover, it is an honor to my queen, Rebecca, her family, all my cousins, friends, and the women who have lost their lives during childbirth. Let us not be quick to judge or offer interventions, but to learn to listen carefully and critically and think of our position in society and the position of the women who are facing these problems, not only in the global South countries, but also here in the United States. As we all know, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. We are the change. Who am I? I'm Princess. I'm Rebecca's oldest daughter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, there it is. All right. Well, I have the challenge of speaking about a very big issue, women's rights and accountability for women's rights, and specifically maternal and reproductive health service access. Now, this is a huge topic, but um, I will run through this and give you as much information as I can in about 10 minutes. Um, we saw that in the last few minutes, um, maternal mortality is um, very high. Um, Lozano et al., uh, the group at IHME, published a paper in 2011 that reviewed the statistics, and the latest is 273,500 in 2011. These are deaths that could have been averted. Many more women, the World Health Organization says 20 times that amount, will suffer injury, infection, or disease. 
lots and lots of women around the world. Um, and there are more vulnerable women than others, poor women, ethnic minorities, women who live in rural areas far away from services, um, and, and others, disabled women. Um, the causes are clear. And if you look at the WHO website, it's very clearly labeled unavailable, inaccessible, unaffordable, and poor quality health care. When women and girls do not have access to services that only they need, such as maternal and reproductive health services, and there could be others, right? There are other services besides this. We're focusing on this today in this discussion because we're, I'm, I'm going to focus on MDG 5. This situation, the lack of access, is not only unfortunate, but it's now considered to be discrimination against women and a violation of human rights. That's a powerful statement. You can do a lot with that, right? So this is an evolving understanding. It is now more than just unfortunate. It is a human rights violation. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about MDG 5 and women's right to health, specifically access to maternal and reproductive health services, accountability mechanisms to hold governments accountable for their political commitments to MDG 5 and their legal commitments, treaty commitments, and local law as well. And if I have time, I'll talk about a case study that I've been involved with. Remembering that MDG 5 initially was about reducing by three quarters, 75 percent, um, maternal mortality ratio from the numbers in 1990 to 2015. That was target 5A. 5B was added because we can't get to that. We can't get to that without um, looking at universal access to uh, reproductive health services, right? So 5B focuses on universal access to reproductive health services because they're inextricably linked. Human rights is about the relationship and the obligations that governments have to its people, right? The, or the, it's really the state, but in, in reality, it's the government in power. The, what the government is obligated to do to its, for its people, to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights obligations. International human rights law supports women's rights, initially with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the first international treaty that speaks about the right to health. And it speaks about the right to the highest attainable standard of health, not just the right to health. CEDAW is the Women's Convention. It's the big human rights document um, that articulates all of the rights for women, civil and political, economic, social, and cultural. The right to health is considered an economic and social right. And then we have the UN Committee's Comment 14 that comes out in 2000 because many people did not understand, many countries did not understand what the right to the highest attainable standard of health really was. They had many questions. They didn't know how to implement it. This is the document that speaks about what the right to the highest attainable standard of health really is. Women's right to health is about lack of discrimination against women. And we see that from the first uh, foundational document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are many levels of discrimination. It can happen at the patient 
health worker level it can happen at the local government policy level and it can happen at the national government level all of these levels must be nondiscriminatory for women to access services that they rightfully have um, in their societies the universal declaration of human rights first talks about health and well-being um, of himself and his family the 1948 document was not um, um, gender neutral we see um, the ICESER speaking about the highest attainable standard of health mental and physical health 187 states parties have signed and ratified or used another process to obligate the states to their um, to fulfilling rights for women the United States unfortunately has not ratified this legal treaty this legal document we have signed CEDA what does CEDA say well it says a lot but we don't have a lot of time so I'm focusing on 12 1 which says that everyone has the right women and men in equal proportion has the right to access health care services including those related to family planning and comment 14 says something about this also it says that there are four elements to measure the right to health and this is very important this is a legal document and and the legal document uh, the lawyers who are drafting this are really using epidemiologic terms which is great they're very general they're not specific but we're talking about availability accessibility acceptability and quality and these are measures that can be used to make sure that governments are fulfilling their rights their obligated rights availability is available functioning health services facilities goods and goods and services in sufficient quantity accessibility has four dimensions to it non-discrimination very important physical accessibility and affordability affordability information accessibility women must have scientifically sound evidence-based information to be healthy that's part of the right to health acceptability requires health services to be respectful of medical ethics as well as culturally appropriate and quality is a good quality of services um, that um, as I mentioned are scientifically and medically appropriate how do we hold governments accountable well there are a few ways um, the primary way under CEDA under the human rights convention is the committee it monitors once a state a country signs and ratifies then they're obligated to write a report usually within the first two years initially and then about every four years later um, so how do we see countries doing this well you know they lag behind the, the timeline um, uh, the the process is not very um, enforceable it's weak enforceability but we're seeing that countries are pressured to do the right thing and report and what about those reports those reports are a little biased they usually write glowing uh, reports about how things are getting better that's what governments do but NGOs local civil society organizations and international organizations work together to write shadow reports these are very important they do primary research they do qualitative research quantitative and qualitative they work to get the real data to supplement the government report to show what's really happening on the ground the committee then reviews all of this information the country report and sometimes 20 NGO reports to come up with recommendations 
That's one way of holding countries accountable. Litigation is another way. Um, you can, you or an NGO, might be able, under certain circumstances, to bring a case to court in the country, out of the country, regionally, in human rights courts. Um, under an optional protocol, which we may be able to get to or maybe not, we can talk about that later, um, uh, 104 uh, countries have, have signed the optional protocol in CEDAW, and they actually um, then are um, allowed to use the CEDAW committee as a quasi-judicial um, way of accountability. Um, just briefly, um, there have been calls for accountability from other uh, forum. For instance, the UN Commission on Information and Accountability for Women's and Children's Health in 2010 called for accountability, called for transparency, called for looking at budgets. This is important. We can't attain MDG 5 or any of the other MDGs if there aren't accountability mechanisms in place. So we're having health and legal uh, professionals and others come together and call for accountability, uh, which is a great, uh, a great change. We also see the High Commissioner on Human Rights in July 2012, uh, just very recently, uh, put out a technical guidance on the application of human rights-based um, approach to the implementation of policies and programs, very long um, a title, to reduce preventable maternal morbidity and mortality. This is great. We've got a human rights um, um, organ of, of the UN uh, calling for um, um, application of human rights to um, improve maternal morbidity and mortality. We've come a long way. So we need to go where the money is. There's growing awareness that accountability for women's health, and in particular MDG 5, requires tracking health resources. And there's a critical role for civil society organizations and international NGOs to work together to hold governments accountable for their commitments legally and politically. Um, I've been involved, this is very brief, um, I've, I've been involved um, in the last five years with um, doing this on the ground, um, holding Indonesia accountable for its commitments to women's health. We have um, worked with um, six NGOs on Java and Sumatra um, to do a um, human rights analysis of women's health policy first, uh, learn about advocacy. We've um, been involved in increasing their skills in advocacy. Everyone in the world does not know how to advocate what the most you know, the most efficient way to do it. Um, all, it's a skill set building uh, exercise, so we've been involved in that. Um, we've also been uh, working uh, with the NGOs um, to look at budgets in the, in the district uh, level. So this is the district is the uh, lowest municipal level responsible um, for health. Um, and um, in this way, we understand what is and what is not being funded. Um, we have seen over the last few years successes um, in advocating for women. Uh, local changes are being um, implemented. There's more money uh, put in in budgets um, for women. NGOs are being asked to participate in gender responsive budgeting and in deciding the allocation of services that are needed. People in the districts, people everywhere, um, must participate in the process in deciding what is important for them. Um, and so this is part of the human rights approach. My final comments are that human rights obviously a lot, but it's also an approach. It's an approach that civil society can use um, to empower women or others, right? When women know they have rights, they can do a lot. 
for themselves. To analyze health policies and systems, we can analyze health systems with a human rights approach and advocate for health rights. Holding governments accountable for their obligations for women's health rights is critical for sustainable improvement in health and meeting MDG 5. And that's an Indonesian sunset, since I talked about Indonesia. Thanks. I, I don't have time to talk about the so thing. So I'll ask the panelists. Great. Well, thank you um, for those very different um, and interesting talks. Um, we heard the scale of this problem of maternal mortality. Um, it's global scale and it's unequal scale um, throughout the world and some of the reasons um, for that. Um, from Cynthia, we've heard the very personal toll that this takes on a family um, and a beautiful tribute. Um, and Beth, very beautifully outlined some of the legal mechanisms that are now available to hold countries accountable um, to their citizens um, in improving maternal health. So I'd like to open the floor um, to questions to the panelists. Um, oh, this is, a, this is a traveling microphone for our panelists. So to, to have this flow in a somewhat organized manner, maybe we can just start on the topic of the scale of the problem or the um, maternal mortality as a, as a global problem. Um, Dillis, maybe you have a, a comment as to, um, with the scale of this problem and the diversity of it globally, where would you put your money if you had $100 million? Um, where do you think the most effective use of that money would be in terms of reducing maternal mortality? There we go. I won't speak loudly then. Um, I think that's a really loaded question. <laughs> and I think that the multi-dimensional nature of the problem is part of what has been the real challenge over the past 10 to 15 years, that as my colleague here said, a lot of it is about advocacy. And if you're a strong advocate and you're able to send your message, you may, you're going to get support and money. And that may not be for the best um, or reasons grounded in evidence. I can say that one of the things that I was looking at in, or thinking about as um, I was listening to the, the legal aspects was that one of the thing that, things that is happening in sort of the more um, implementation of interventions to sort of save lives and sort of the medical side or what do you do at the clinic or what do you do in the community or do you need to get them blood, do you need to get them ambulances, all of those decisions you know, through the past 50 years, we've studied what works and we know what works. And the real issue now in, in my field, our field, is how do you get people to do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it? And the science has now turned to measuring how you do that and what are the success stories and how do you make that work. And when I'm thinking about the legal aspects, it's sort of simple. There's rules to human rights, women's rights, reproductive rights. But how do you then translate that into changes on the ground in the country, in the community, in the society? Um, to, and as you say, it's accountability as part of that. But is there sort of a science to know how to, know how to make those decisions about how to, how to sort of measure that accountability? My comment. Um, so one way to measure um, accountability um, is, well, I guess going through the, the list of um, mechanisms for accountability. Um, if if um, there is um, a case brought to a court um, and there is a case that is won, um, that not only uh, that judgment uh, may, um, depending on if it's, if it's in a, a court, uh, 
with a force of law with, um, of the decision or the CEDAW committee, which does not have the same force of law that a court would have. It's, it, it comes out with recommendations and the country can or cannot actually implement that. So it, it, anyway, so, you know, look at judgments. Look at what, what has happened. So in the case that was um, supposed to be discussed by um, Jen Langalong, um, and I can refer to now, um, it, it was the Alan da Silva Pimental uh, v. Brazil. So this case was about a Brazilian a woman, an Afro-Brazilian woman, who died um, and a uh, case was brought because Brazil um, is, part of the, is part of the optional protocol. It was brought to the CEDAW committee, this quasi-judicial mechanism. And the case um, uh, was uh, successful um, after many, um, much effort by many organizations, uh, one of which is the Center for Reproductive Rights here in the United States that helped bring this case. These cases are huge, so it you know, took a lot to to actually bring this case uh, with a local NGO to the CEDAW committee, right? And uh, the case was won. Now, were there reparations? Um, not yet. It's in negotiation. Is this case um, important? It's critical. It's the first time that an international human rights body has decided anything about maternal mortality. This is huge. You've got an international human rights, you know, body talking about um, whether this was discrimination, and they decided, yes, it was discrimination that caused this woman an inappropriate health care that caused this woman to die. This is very important. And so I would say this moves accountability forward. Brazil is pressured to do the right thing. This also... Um, influences other countries' behaviors, I would argue, because this information went global, you know, and especially in, in the Internet age, uh, these decisions do have influence on, on behavior. Um, and so I would argue that's one way. Look at decisions. Um, there are, um, there's an inter-American court decision recently um, in, that, that's very important um, in Paraguay. Uh, it was a successful case, and, and this was um, in a court, a human rights court. So, so that's very important. Um, in terms of other ways um, to measure accountability, I think that um, changes in policies, uh, locally, nationally, um, changes in health metrics, right? All the changes. Um, uh, you know, more access for rural women, you know. How, how far away, how many kilometers is it to uh, uh, a nearest a skilled um, birth attendant? Uh, you know, the, the same metrics we use for, for you, know, you know. And again, universal access to reproductive health services. That's comprehensive reproductive health services. We have that issue in the United States as well. And so we need to be monitoring. We need to be reporting. We need to be calling out what is and isn't um, a violation um, of law or um, political commitments for women here. Thank you. Comment in the back.
Yeah, I'm going to just repeat that very briefly so we can have that question on our recorded session. So the, to just briefly summarize, the question is, how do we translate these high-level political, legal conversations and activities down to the grassroots emergency level on the field? Yeah. And I think that that was beautifully said, thank you, because I think that uh, you share my belief that not only, you know, in everyone is pushing advocacy and everyone is pushing sort of new technologies and new, not how to fill out the partogram, but how do you design a new fancy partogram that's easier to fill out versus just the basics. And I think the answer comes when funders decide they want to fill out the middle rather than push the borders, push the borders of advocacy or human rights, and push the borders of technology and solar panels and, you know, whatever you can do, they say low tech, but how do you then take that to that clinic where that woman has been brought in in a wheelbarrow and those people there need to deal with the situation urgently? And I, I think it's, you know, filling out that middle is a key to the next 10, 15 years. So, um I hear what you're saying, but there is a connection, and I think that we all have a role in making that connection better. So in the, Pimel, in the Pimental case that I just described, I didn't go into detail because we have no time, but Brazil now has to make all these changes for rural women, for ethnic minorities, for, you know, there's a, there's a list of things that they must do now, and they're starting to do it because of this decision. So if people in NGOs um, that I, I'm hoping they're representing vulnerable women and others, voice that to people who can do this other work and connect the dots, that's how change will happen. See what I'm saying? Also, I, I, I would, after the putting, um, I think there's sort of been a pendulum swing towards this putting so much on the role of the NGO, and certainly in the work that I do, which is trying to get on the ground health workers to work effectively, really requires not the NGO, but the local government and the local structure and the local way it works. And, and money. And, and money, and the money goes to the NGOs and not to the, you know, there's a, it's a whole multiple level layers of it. Let's continue this conversation. Question in the back. Just a, I'm going to give a very quick thing. I think we start at looking at examples that have worked and where countries have models that have done this sort of thing. That they, you know, Bangladesh is a great example. And we try to learn from those and um, continue learning. Um, have, I'll just talk on a perspective of somebody who's been in the U.S. for three years. This is my fourth year. So... Every country is different. I agree with Dr. Dillis. You look at where um, the model has what. But now in the case of Africa, whereby it's war here, war there, you, if you want to make any change, I think, I don't know, you can add more, but I think you start at the community level with the people who are facing that pro problem in their everyday lives. It's not like you're going to go to the government or you're going to go to the community leader. 
Yes, you can go to the community leader, but I'll tell you, 80% of the time, sometimes it benefits them. It's not about the women who are dying every day that I've watched or I've experienced and I've been going back there. You can listen. It's better to, to be humble and listen to the problems <laughs> before you come with your intervention and impose there. And even if you want to impose that intervention or whatever policy, it's good to work with the community, but remember when the NGO is done, you leave the country. It, what about the ministries of health that you're living there? You haven't taught them anything. They haven't even learned anything from you. So I think it's also important, though most of the time we think they're corrupt, it's also good to work and